quiet country neighborhood. In this case, it was our job to come to the scene and work with the investigators to try and determine what happened and who was responsible. In order to solve the crime, you have to read the clues. Bradenton, Florida, a sleepy town on the shores of the Gulf Coast. But for some of its residents, the calm is about to be shattered. At 1019 a.m., a 911 operator receives a desperate call for help. Police and fire, can I help you? Please, I'm sorry, I'm not going to make it clear. Okay, so where are you at? The caller says he is in the home of his estranged wife and his two daughters. We're going through a divorce and she wants to freak out. His next words are chilling. What's the matter? Oh, my wife killed herself and one of my daughters. And my other daughters are saturated in blood. Emergency personnel race to the scene, but it's too late. Dewey Brannon, the man who called 911, is in shock. His wife, Sherry, and their two daughters are dead. Detective Rick Gerken is one of the first law enforcement officers to arrive at the Brannon home that morning. Your first instinct in going to a scene like this is this is like every person's worst nightmare when the officer arrives at the house he finds dewey brannon in his ups uniform waiting for him the information that mr brannon gave um, was that he thought because he knew that they had a gun that she had killed the girls and then killed herself but when investigators and the medical examiner take a closer look at the crime scene brannon's story does not add up the wounds that were all stab wounds were not self-inflicted. And that's when we knew after that point that it wasn't a murder-suicide, that we had a homicide on our hands. First, investigators tried to determine if this may have been a burglary gone wrong. And there are certain things that you look for, like is money missing, jewelry missing, other valuables inside the house, are they missing, are there forced entry? In this case, we didn't have forced entry. There wasn't anything taken. But a few things were left behind. Partial shoe prints outlined in blood are visible on the floor. Near them, a fingerprint, also smeared in blood. A piece of yellow twine is found beneath Sherry's body. Under her fingernail, the medical examiner finds what could be human tissue. But there is no murder weapon. We knew that it was a knife that caused the, the wounds that we were looking at. Um, we didn't find anything in the residence that was bloody. We drained two lakes or two ponds in search of those. We spent countless hours with metal detectors scouring all the adjoining property. But investigators find nothing that could point them towards the killer. So Detective Gherkin decides to call in outside help. I had recently been to a school on profiling and was quite aware of the capabilities that they had and the assistance that they could aid in investigation. The profiler he calls is Special Agent Dale Hinman. As soon as Detective Gherkin showed us the crime scene pictures, we all knew this is something that we wanted to be involved in really quickly. Trained by the FBI, Agent Hinman knows how to read a crime scene and often finds clues to a criminal's identity in his behavior before, during, or after the crime. In any homicide investigation, the logical place to begin is close to the victim. So the spouse would be considered a suspect first and then you'd work outward from there once the spouse was eliminated. But in this case, Dewey Brannon did and said things that made him particularly suspicious. Dewey Brannon, the man who had found his own family murdered, is a UPS manager. His wife, Sherry, was a nurse. They were high school sweethearts and had been married 15 years. But a few months before the tragedy, Dewey had moved out to live with his girlfriend. But it was Dewey's behavior after the murders that aroused suspicion. Police expect that when someone's murdered, their spouse wants to participate and help in any way they can to solve the case. Dewey Brandon got an attorney and wouldn't speak to the police again. So we couldn't question him as new information came up. We couldn't go to him and ask him to clarify or to explain different points. 
Detective Gherkin is left to search the case file for additional clues. When he listens to the recording of the 911 call made the morning of the murders, something strikes him as odd. What's the matter? Oh, my wife killed herself and one of my daughters. Sir, it's gonna be okay, all right? It's not gonna be okay. I've got dead people here. Because of me. That statement in itself was alarming to us. Why would Dewey Brannan say that the deaths occurred because of him? Was he simply expressing guilt about leaving his wife or something else? In interviewing Sherry Brannan's co-workers, we obtained information that Mr. Brannan made a comment that for Sherry's birthday, he was going to harm her in, the, in front of the children and that she'd be real surprised what he could do with the knife. Sherry Brannan was killed with a knife on her 35th birthday. Investigators begin to focus their attention on her husband, Dewey. Crime scene technicians found bloody fingerprints at the crime scene, and they lifted the prints and sent them to the lab, and the prints matched Dewey Brannan. Sherry Brannan and her two daughters have been murdered in their own home. Bloody fingerprints of Sherry's husband, Dewey, are found at the crime scene, and investigators now suspect that Dewey himself may have killed his own family. But the fingerprints turn out to have a less sinister meaning than police originally thought. We knew from the 911 call that Dewey Brand had been inside of the crime scene. In fact, he had carried his daughter outside. So the prints really didn't prove anything because they were supposed to be there. Dewey Brannan remains a prime suspect, but Dale Hinman decides to start from scratch to see if someone else might fit the profile she's developing. First stop, the crime scene. My first impression of this crime scene was that it was very remote, that it took a long ride to get back here from the interstate, and that it didn't seem likely to me that the individual who would come out to this neighborhood at that hour would be just aimlessly driving around looking, because you leave all of the neighborhoods and then drive for quite a distance until you come to Panther Ridge, this neighborhood. Right. And these homes here, this home and the home next to it, were the only two that were completely finished. This was no random crime. The killer knew exactly where to find the remote neighborhood. But this is only the first step in developing a profile. What was your first impression about how the killer gained entry into this residence? Upon our initial arrival at the scene, we couldn't find any signs of forced entry into the residence. The fact that there was no forced entry um, led me to believe that the, the killer came and knocked on the door and that she opened the door because she recognized him. Hinman needs more information to refine her profile. The search for clues takes her inside the house. Here, most of the evidence is written in blood. She turns to criminalist Toby Wilson to read it. He is an expert at analyzing blood spatter. The most common type of patterning you'll find at a violent crime scene is what's called an impact spatter pattern. In his lab, Wilson recreates what he found at the crime scene. I'm gonna put a little puddle of blood here. And I'm just going to hit it, and it should spray some blood up onto the wall here. See the patterning that came out from where I hit? This is an impact pattern. They can be reconstructed to show us where the blood source was so we can actually start to put the crime scenes back together. Toby Wilson examines the blood inside the house. But what intrigues him most is actually found on the outside. When you looked at the exterior of the house in front of that door area, there was some blood outside the house. And the only way that blood could get there is if the door was open at the time that blood was put in flight. This information is crucial to reconstructing how the attack began and who the attacker was. The blood tends to indicate that she opened the door for the assailant. A key point of Agent Hinman's profile has been confirmed. Sherry Brannan knew her attacker. Analyzing the blood spatter patterns told us that Sherry Brannan met her attacker at the door. So she probably opened the door, and it would only make sense she would open the door if she knew the person who was standing on the other side. But that isn't the only information we gained from the blood spatter patterns. Partial shoe prints are visible moving up the stairs. But without detailed prints, investigators can't compare them to the shoes of potential suspects, including Dewey Brannan. Analysts pin their hopes on a forensic tool called luminol. We'll be able to demonstrate 
how it works by getting some blood on my shoe here and then just walking on these two pieces of carpet that we have. And you can see a hint of the blood on them, but it's not real clear what you're looking at. So the use of the luminol will help define what the pattern shape is. The chemical binds with a portion of the hemoglobin, and when that binding happens, it, it luminesces. This is exactly what happens in the Brannon house. To the naked eye, partial prints start up the staircase and disappear. But as this police video shows, Luminol transforms the tracks into clearly readable prints and reveals a trail leading all the way up the stairs and into the bedroom where the second victim was found. What intrigues Agent Hinman, however, is where the killer didn't walk. He didn't go anywhere in the house except for where the victim and each of her daughters were. If this was a stranger and a transient, first off, how would he have even found Panther Ridge? How would he know that there would be a woman and two young small children there that were vulnerable? Would have been a person who knew the layout of the property and knew the layout of the house. Dewey Brannon matches all the key points in Agent Hinman's profile. He knew where the house was, his wife would have let him in, and he would have known where to find the children. He is still a very good suspect. And when Dewey requests time alone with the victim's bodies before the funeral, investigators see their chance. We all thought it was very suspicious and very unusual that Dewey Brannon wanted to spend time alone with the bodies. So we decided to write a search warrant to wire the caskets to find out while he was there what he was going to say. Maybe there was a chance he would say something incriminating. Coming up, will Dewey Brannon confess to the murder of his family at their own funeral? Six days after their murder, the bodies of Sherry Brannon and her children are laid to rest. Dewey Brannon, the husband, is a prime suspect. When he requests time alone with the caskets before the funeral, investigators wonder what he will say. When Dewey asked for private time with the caskets, we were curious about why, and he wanted to be alone with them. So we thought that the best thing to do at that point would be to let him have the time to wire the caskets using a search warrant and do it all completely legally to see what it is he said. Investigators hope that Dewey will say something incriminating, maybe even confess to his victims while he is alone with them. Before the funeral, the coffins are arranged in a small, private room. Dewey spends nearly an hour sitting next to the caskets, while investigators listen in on every word he says. It was a very hard decision for us to come to, to wire the caskets, because this was really an invasion of his privacy with his family. But we had three innocent victims to consider. Dewey really didn't say much of anything or nothing that was incriminating. Without any concrete evidence to implicate Dewey, investigators continue their efforts to identify other potential suspects. Just about every detective we had in the agency was involved in following up leads, going out and conducting interviews, generating more leads. Guided by Agent Hinman's profile, they continue to look at people who knew Sherry Brannon. We suggested that the investigators should focus on people who had been inside of the Brannon house, people who were involved in construction, landscaping, delivery people who had been inside of the Brannon house and knew who was there. Investigators are still waiting for one crucial piece of evidence to be examined, the human tissue found under Sherry Brannon's fingernail. The victim of the struggle may defend themselves or may attack the actual person that's uh, trying to attack them and possibly get some uh, tissue or blood or even hairs underneath uh, their fingernail, um, fingernails, and that can then uh, be used forensically, DNA-wise, to determine whose tissue that possibly is. But the process of extracting DNA from a piece of human tissue isn't easy, and it takes time. 
The tissue sample, I'm taking certain chemicals and I'm heating the sample to release the DNA by breaking open the cells. This machine is called a centrifuge, and what it does to the samples is, is it spins very quickly and it pulls the DNA to the bottom of the tubes. The samples are then loaded into a genetic analyzer, which produces a graphic representation of a person's DNA. What Brian Higgins discovers throws the entire investigation for a loop. Once I received the DNA sample from Dewey Brandon, I compared it to the DNA sample from the uh, tissue underneath the victim's fingernail, and those profiles were different. So therefore, Dewey Brandon was excluded. When Sherry Brandon opened the door that tragic night, it was not her husband who walked in and killed her. But Dewey Brannon is still not completely in the clear. Once we found out that the DNA didn't match Mr. Brannon, there was a concern that there were possibly a murder for hire or an accomplice that may have been at the residence. Because we know that he had been there the night before and then there was a pretty intense argument that took place. But with Dewey Brannon no longer their prime suspect, Investigators have to consider other possibilities. All of us several times said, if it's not the victim's husband, then it's. And we would describe someone who was familiar with the property, who knew the victim, who knew the family circumstance, knew that both of the children would have been at the house and where in the house they actually would have been. Investigators develop a list of everyone who has been to the Brannon house recently. Visitors, contractors, repairmen. They are working down the list when Detective Gherkin overhears a conversation in the police station and instantly triggers a promising new lead. A sergeant was briefing my lieutenant on a sexual battery that occurred the night before. The suspect's name was Larry Parks. Um, it immediately was, you know, bells and whistles went off because his name did come up on our list as being one of the construction workers in the area. Coming up next... Could construction worker Larry Parks be the killer investigators are searching for? DNA evidence has revealed that Dewey Brannon did not kill his own family. Investigators have now identified another man who fits Agent Hinman's profile of the killer. A construction worker named Larry Parks has been to the Brannon house and knew all the victims. And recently, he was arrested for assaulting another woman. As soon as I was notified that Larry Parks had been arrested by the Manatee County Sheriff's Department. It made so much sense to all of us uh, that he had been to the property, that he had um, worked on the retention pond that was in the victim's yard, that he had been inside the victim's home, that he knew both of her children. Detectives obtain a search warrant for Larry Parks' residence, and what they find astounds them. I observed some twine that appeared to be similar to the twine that was found at the Brandon residence. And I also pair, observed a pair of uh, Reebok tennis shoes that seemed to be similar to those found at the Brandon residence. When investigators compare the yellow construction twine, they have a match. And when they compare the Reebok tennis shoes to the prints found at the Brandon home, another match. We obtained a uh, search warrant for his person and obtained a blood draw from him and immediately rushed those off to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for uh, analysis to our known sample. When Brian Higgins compares the DNA found under Sherry Brannon's fingernails to Larry Park's DNA, another match, and this time, a conclusive one. The DNA sample from Larry Parks matched the DNA sample from the tissue underneath the victim's fingernail. And that means that it is, in fact, Larry Parks tissue. Larry Parks is charged with the murder of Sherry Brannon and her two daughters. Investigators find no evidence that Dewey Brannon or anyone else hired Larry Parks as a contract killer. And when Dewey finally comes face to face with the man who killed his family, his anger and sadness can't be contained. It only takes three people. You took the souls of hundreds of people. There's little girls that don't know how to understand why she'll be in Cassie. They don't come to school anymore. How do you explain that? When you step into that prison, welcome to hell. When you go to bed at night, I want you to envision what you did that night. Because I envision it every night in my head. To avoid the death penalty, Larry Parks pleads guilty to first-degree murder. He admits killing Sherry in a rage and then killing her daughters because they recognized him. His confession is read in court. 
Mr. Parks attacked Cassidy Brannon with a sharp instrument in the area of the foyer. When Dewey Brannon hears in the killer's own words what happened to his family that night, his outrage finally boils over. <laughs> After the emotional outbreak, Larry Parks receives three consecutive life sentences. We may never know the real reason why Larry Parks went to the Brandon house that night, but the important thing is that he's behind bars and he can't hurt anyone else.